All right, so we're in Acts 27. Dun, 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 dun. Does that bring memory to anybody? Oh, you got it. Pastor Stevens is, old, is older than me. Gilligan's Island. And <laughs> you're welcome, Pastor Steve. So, so I, I did that little jingle because we're in a shipwreck today. Remember Gilligan's Island shipwreck, right? And we're going to see Paul get in a shipwreck today. And we're going to see a storm, a northeasterly storm that rises up. In context, remember, Paul was arrested, brought to Caesarea for two years. He appealed to Caesar. And now because he's appealed to Caesar, they're bringing him to Rome so he can be sentenced by the Roman emperor um, in Rome. And so Paul's on his way. um, And as he's on his way, we're going to see today, he gets into a northeasterly storm. And it's a shipwreck. Now, here's what I'm going to show you today as we go through this scripture. Great application today. We're going to show you two ways that will bring storms in your life. So the soldiers in this chapter did a couple things that brought the storm into their lives. So we're going to see two ways that we can avoid storms in the first place. And then what we're going to see is we're going to see six ways that Paul helped them survive the storm and even get through the storm. And so we're going to see two ways to avoid storms, but then if we're in a storm, we're going to see Paul's leadership bringing them through the storm. And we're going to see six principles this morning that will help you if you have a storm in your life. You know there's storms all throughout the Bible. Go back to Noah. Remember Noah, because of the unrighteousness of the people on earth, God brought a storm for 40 days and 40 nights, covered the earth not only with rain, but he covered the earth to the point the mountains couldn't even be seen because he brought so much of a storm upon the earth. Other storms, think of Jonah. And Jonah, by the way, brought the storm on because Jonah was told to go preach to Nineveh and he went the other way in a boat. And God brought a storm. And then he was fish bait after that, right? And he was swallowed by great fish. And then then there's other storms in the New Testament. Remember the disciples told to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee by themselves. And Jesus was up on the mountain praying. And then the storm hit. And what did Jesus do? He walked to them on the water. And he said, it is I, do not be afraid. He took care of him in the midst of the storm. And then another storm, remember there were, Jesus was actually on the boat with the disciples in the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Good principle there is Jesus is always on our boat in storms. He's always with us. But remember that Jesus was on that boat and the storm hit the Sea of Galilee and the disciples woke him up and said, he was sleeping, said, hey, don't you care that we're perishing, Jesus? And Jesus said, oh, you a little faith. Don't you know who you got in the boat with you right now? He stood up. He looked out of the raging sea of Galilee and he said, hush, be still. And it went calm, dead calm after that. And so we're going to see two ways that we can avoid storms from this chapter 27. And then six ways we could survive storms and be okay in the midst of storms. And I don't know what storm you might be in this morning. Some of you probably here are in storms. You might be in a... Financial storm, struggling financially. You might be in a marriage storm. There's just stuff going on that's storming in your marriage. You might be in a work storm. You're in a work situation that's storming in your life. You might be in a health storm. I don't know. But these principles from Paul's leadership, and we're going to see how to avoid that sometimes too, will help you this morning. So we're in chapter 27, Acts 27. If you're there, say amen. And it's a great chapter, again, of how to deal with storms in our lives. So let's jump in. Chapter 27, verse 1, it says, And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in an Adramadian ship, which was about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. And then... The next day, we put in at Sidon. So we see here, Paul's got a traveling companion, Aristarchus, and then he also has Luke with him because it says, we put out to sea. And the next day, we again, with Luke, put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed Paul to go to his friends and receive care. Interesting. Paul had friends everywhere. Wherever he traveled, there was people that he ministered to and were his friends in Christ. Wonderful. If you even read the, I'm going through Romans right now in my quiet times in, in the morning, and I just read through Romans chapter 16, and just in Rome where he's going, uh, he's going right now, 
He lists 26 different friends that were in Rome when he wrote that letter to the Romans. Paul was a man of fellowship. We should be too. Amen? And so he, he goes to his friends and receives care, verse 4. And from there we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And when we sailed through the sea along the coast, um, it says, of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra, at Lycia. And there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship. So there's switching ships now. The Alexandrian ship was from Africa, and it usually carried wheat and supplies. And they were sailing for Italy, which was Rome. And he put us aboard it. And when we had sailed slowly for a good many days, and with difficulty, we arrived in Snidus. And since the wind did not permit us to go farther, we sailed under the shelter of Crete. Now, Crete's the island out in the Mediterranean, off Salome. And with difficulty sailing past, we came to a certain place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. And when considerable time had passed, and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was over, the fast was up for the Day of Atonement, so they're into October now, Paul began to admonish them and said, Men, I perceive that this voyage will be attended with damage, great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul. And because of the harbor was not suitable for wintering, the majority reached a decision. All the sailors reached a decision to put out to sea from there. If somehow they would reach Phoenix, which was on the other side of Crete, facing southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. So do you get the scene? Paul's on the ship. He says, guys, we should stay in Fair Havens. Why? Because the winter storms were coming. They were in October. And Paul says, this is not going to be good if we sail all the way to Phoenix. Now, question, why did these experienced sailors want to put themselves in danger and keep going into winter storms? Because Fair Havens, where they were docked at, was a small little podunk town. There was nothing to do there. It's kind of like if we, you know, ended up in some small little town in South Carolina and you had a whole ship full of sailors. Nothing to do. Now, Phoenix, going around Crete, it's a bigger city. There's places of entertainment. There's stuff for them to do. So he said, let's, let's risk it and let's go all the way to Phoenix. And now, you might be saying, well, what did Paul know about, you know, sailing? He was a tent maker. Here's what Paul knew. We know by this time, 2 Corinthians, it tells us in Corinthians that Paul had already faced three shipwrecks. 2 Corinthians 11.25 says, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. And look at this. I spent a night and a day in the deep. Paul been there. He'd been in the school of hard knocks. He understood what they were facing if they go into winter storms. But these sailors said, let's do it anyways. Let's take a vote. And the majority said, let's keep going. Here's the first way you can avoid storms. Very important. If you want to avoid storms, number one, you're going to have a storm if you disregard danger for the desires of your flesh. Do you see that? Oftentimes, we go into storms because we're disregarding the danger that we know we're getting into, and we do it anyways because of the desires of our flesh. Seen it? I've seen men, men that I respect, get into inappropriate relationships, and they were Christians, and they were even pastors sometimes, and they knew better. But because of their desires of the flesh, they got into inappropriate relationships and it ruined their ministry and their marriage. Bad storm brought it on themselves. I've seen people with financial decisions make really unwise, unwise decisions financially because the desires of their flesh, jacking up their credit cards, going way into debt, everything else, and they brought the financial storm on because of the desires of their flesh. I've seen people get into addictions and they knew, multiple times going back to the addiction, even though they knew the danger that was involved with that addiction because of the desires of their flesh. So here's the first thing. You want to avoid storms. Deny the flesh. Take up your cross and listen. Follow Jesus. And you, we have this instinct in us. We know we're getting into danger. And the Holy Spirit will convict us as Christians too and follow that conviction of the Holy Spirit and don't go into danger. Stay away from it. Paul several times warns them of this danger. Go back to the scriptures again. It's amazing. He says in, in verse 4, he says this. It says, 
uh, he didn't say it, but it says, we were under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. Verse 7, it says, um, since the wind did not permit us to go farther, we sailed under the shelter of Crete. Verse 8, it says, with difficulty, we were sailing past a certain place. And then in verse 9, it says, and when considerable time had passed, the voyage was now dangerous. But they still voted, voted by the majority to go into the storm because they were going with the desires of the flesh rather than the wisdom of what they should have been uh, adhering to. Second thing I see in this story here, too, they not only disregarded danger for the desires of the flesh, but they disregarded the counsel of a godly man. Paul stands up, and he makes it very clear. Hey, we're going to lose life here. We're going to lose stuff. This is going to be a bad storm. We're going to die in this storm, Paul's saying, basically. And what do they do? They disregard the counsel of a godly man. Scripture is very clear on this. You want to be, be uh, staying out of storms. It says in Proverbs eleven fourteen, where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselors, there's victory. Proverbs twelve fifteen, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to what? Counsel, right? Proverbs nineteen twenty to twenty one says, "Listen to counsel, accept discipline, that you might be wise the rest of your days." Many. Many plans are in a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord will what? Stand. Proverbs 15, 22. Without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they what? Succeed. And lastly, Proverbs 24, 6. For by wise guidance you will wage war, and in an abundance of counselors, there's what? Victory. See that, church. One of the ways we can, we can avoid storms is getting godly counsel, and then listen and then listening to the council and doing it. I love being a pastor. I have friends that are in their 60s along with me now. They say, when are you going to retire? I say, retire? Well, I'll, I'll say what Pastor Chuck said. Why should I retire when I'm not tired in the first place? But also, I, I said, I'm not going to retire. Why would I quit doing so my love? I love teaching God's word. I love leading our staff. I love building this church and being a part of that. I ain't going to quit. I love what I'm doing. But there's one thing I don't love. So I have someone in my office, and God's given me clear counsel to give to them, and I give them godly counsel according to scriptures, and I can just tell by their body language, there ain't no way they're going to listen to that counsel. And then I watch them, and they disregard the counsel, and what they do is they go right into the storm. A marriage storm, financial storm, job storm, and I just go, oh. I told you, biblically, this is what you need to do. Because of the desires of their flesh, they go the other way. Hey, one of the greatest things we could do is follow the counsel of God's word, amen? Let God's word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And get some godly people around us that when we have to make decisions, we run it by them and we get counsel. And then if they're godly and the counsel's godly and the counsel's biblical, listen to it. Even though your flesh doesn't want to go there. Amen? And so they disregarded godly counsel. And hey, I'm right there with you. Been there, done that. Remember when we moved to Wisconsin to start our second church? I had this brilliant idea. And that was there was this frozen yogurt shop right across the street from the dorms. We were trying to reach a lot of these college students. And it was for sale. And I had just moved there from Southern California. Frozen yogurt. It's the greatest, latest thing. I could buy this thing and be a tent maker, provide for my ministry and stuff, meet a bunch of college kids, and even make some money. <clears throat> I didn't know that people in Wisconsin don't eat frozen yogurt. <laughs> they like custard. And not only that, I, I, didn't, I didn't take into account that starting in October, we're in the frozen tundra of America. <laughs> no one's going to eat frozen stuff when it's 40 below wind chill. And I remember, I remember I had this great idea, and then I ran it by my dad, who had been running a real estate business in Chicago for 30 years. And he said, well, son, I really don't think you've done your research here. I really don't think that you've done enough work looking into what you're buying here. Don't do it. I said, Dad, started a church already. We're starting a second church. I know what I'm doing. This will be great. And it led to one of the longest years of my life. 
And the only thing that sh- I survived that shipwreck of that business, the only thing that happened was in spring, after we had started the church, a guy walked into the shop and he said, hey, all these colors are exactly the colors of my franchise, Subway kind of franchise. It wasn't Subway, it was another sandwich shop franchise. He said, this is perfect for me. And you know, the colors are all right, and I'll, I'll buy the shop. And he gave me exactly what I paid for it the year before. And I said, out of here. And I was saved by just this miraculous thing of this guy buying the shop. Otherwise, we would have lost our shirt because I didn't listen to counsel. Sometimes storms come because we don't listen to counsel of people that are wiser and smarter than us. And we need to go back to that. Amen? All right, so that's the two things to avoid storms. Number one, don't disregard danger just because you have desires of the flesh to go into the danger. Number two, listen to godly counsel. Paul's giving them godly counsel. We're gonna lose our lives here. We're gonna lose everything if we do this. And they didn't listen to it. They voted against it. Now let's go on with our story. Verse 13. And when a moderate south wind came up, supposing that they'd gained their purpose, they weighed anchor and began sailing along Crete, close inshore. But before very long, they rushed down from a land of violent wind called the Uroquilla, Literally, that's the northeast storm that was coming in because of the winter storms. And when the ship was caught in it and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and let ourselves to be driven along. And running under the shelter of a small island called Clauda, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. And now the ship's boat is the dinghy that would be the lifeboat. And after that, they hoisted it up. They used supporting cables in undergirding the ship They're putting cables so the ship doesn't get torn apart by the storm. And fearing that they might run aground on the shallows of citrus, they can't let down the sea anchor and so let themselves be driven along. The next day, we were being violently storm-tossed. They began to jettison the cargo. In other words, they started throwing the suitcases overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. They started throwing up what they had for getting food, fish, they threw it overboard because they needed to stay higher up in the water. And since neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, no small storm was assailing us. From then on, all hope of our being saved was gradually abandoned. They lost all hope. And interesting, too, they they, they couldn't see the stars in the sun because there's such clouds in the storm. Now, why is that dangerous? How were they directed as sailors in that time? By the sun and the stars. They couldn't even be directed. They, they, They didn't even know where they were going out in the middle of the sea. You ever felt like that in a storm, by the way? Not only do you lose hope, but you don't even know the direction that you're going. You're lost in the midst of the storm, and that's what they were. And then it says in verse 21, and when they had gone a long time without food, then Paul stood up in their midst and said, men, you ought to have followed my advice. What's Paul doing here? I told you so. Don't you hate that when people do that? They give you God the counsel, you don't listen to it, major storm, and they go, oh, should have listened to me. I told you so. Husbands, do your wives do that to you too? I tell you, our wives give us some great counsel sometimes, and we don't listen to it, and it's like, you should have listened to me. One of my best counselors oftentimes is Heidi. I run stuff by Heidi all the time, because I've learned after 36 years of marriage, she's got the wisdom. And I've learned when I don't listen to her sometimes, not only does it go bad and go south, but I don't want to, it's, I don't want to hear that. I told you, she doesn't say, I told you so all the time. She doesn't do that. She just kind of looks at me after I mess up. <laughs> right? I told you. It doesn't say it verbally. I just get the look. And that's what Paul's doing right now too. It's like, I told you not to, I, I, you should have listened to me. <laughs> Interesting, and since neither son, uh, go verse, uh, verse uh, 22, yet now, verse 22, I urge you to keep, on, keep up your courage, for there shall be no loss of life among you, only of the ship. For this very night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me, saying, don't be afraid, Paul. He gets an angelic visit. He says, you must stand before Caesar, and behold, God has granted you all the things that all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, Paul, keep up your courage, men, for I believe God that I will, it will turn out exactly as I've been told. But, he says, but there'll be consequences. We must run aground on a certain island. So you see what's going on now? Paul's exercising his leadership. 
Paul's a great leader. Doesn't matter he's a prisoner. He stands up in the midst of the storm. 276 people on this ship. And he says, hey, guys, I've had an angel, angelic visit. And you need, you need his, you know, in the midst of your no hope, not having any direction, do you need to understand the storm? God's got it. He's told me. He's told me that he's going to fulfill his promise that I will be in Rome and I'll preach the gospel in Rome. And he's told me that we're, I'm going to have courage because he's going to do what he said he's going to do. Here's two principles. First principle, when you're facing a storm, very important. Be like Paul and stay in God's presence. When did he get this angelic visit? I believe it went while he was seeking God and praying. This angel appeared to him at nighttime while he was praying. And folks, the greatest thing we could do when we're in the midst of a storm is stay in God's presence. I love what it says in Proverbs about this. It talks about this, Proverbs 18.10. It says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they're what? Safe. I love Psalm 18, 1 to 3. It says, this is David. And he spoke these words of the Lord in, the, in this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies. And he said this, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I will be saved from my enemies. See the importance of staying in God's presence? And not only just staying in God's presence in a storm, but running into it. We should run into God's presence. You know why that's important too? Because the devil works best in having us and devouring us in isolation. The Bible's very clear. Ecclesiastes 4 says, two are better than one, and a cord of three strands is not easily broken. That's why, hey, if you're in a storm or you're facing storms, the best thing you could do is stay in God's presence. The best thing you could do is stay in God's presence when your devotions, the best thing you could do is stay in God's presence by keeping yourself in church because this is where God dwells, in his presence right here where two or three are gathered in his name. He's here in our midst. And in his presence is fullness of joy in the midst of the storm. The worst thing you could do when you're in a storm is stay away from God's presence and run away from God instead of run to God. We need to stay in God's presence. That's what Paul's doing here. He was in God's presence when this angel appeared to him at nighttime, probably because he was praying. We need to do the same thing. We had the privilege this last week of hosting our, our, the missionary Jackie from Uganda and Carol Oliver. They stayed at our house for a couple nights. Wow, you talk about passionate, on fire Jesus people. I was getting affected by Jesus, by just being around them. Wonderful people. And Jackie, um, she runs this orphanage over in um, Uganda. And I tell you what, we are in a bubble here in America compared to Uganda. She's telling me about this orphanage. She's got 60 plus kids that are just babies. Zero to one year olds. And these little kids are just thrown out, and, and she takes them on. She's building a baby house for them right now. It's wonderful. But I was talking to her about it, and I said, well, where did all these babies come from that don't have moms? She said, you don't understand our culture. Our culture is so dark, so evil, that men come into women's and girls' homes and rape them, and then they get pregnant from the rape, and then they don't want the kid because it's from a rape. And so we take the kids. And that's just a part of their culture. And she says it happens from five years old and, and, and up for girls to be raped in that culture. Disastrous. She told me about, too, that it's just so violent that her husband was on a, 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 like a big pickup truck where they were transporting people and stuff, and that's how they do it over there, I guess. And these people came on the truck with metal rods and beat her husband to the point they got brain damage. And just a couple weeks ago, after several years of fighting brain damage, her husband died. That's the kind of culture. And this is the kind of storm she faces on a regular basis. And I was trying to think, how do you have such joy in Jesus, and how do you even survive these storms? You just lost her husband. You know one of the things she told me that I got insight from? What they do 
they're, they're, all the ladies in her home, they have hundreds of people involved in their ministry over there. What they do every single day is they go to bed early. Everybody in their ministry, hundreds of people, they wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And from 3 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the morning, all those ladies, all the people in a part of her ministry, they pray for an hour. And they get into God's presence. And then they go back to bed at 4 o'clock for a couple hours and go, praise the Lord, that's a good idea. But the, one of the reasons they are a thriving ministry over there is because they spend an hour of prayer every morning seeking God's face at 3 o'clock in the morning. And that helps them survive the storm. We need to do more of that, Amen. Second thing I see in there, after they, they stayed in God's presence, also, Paul trusted in God's promises. What was, what was Paul doing there? He's going back to the promise that God had made him that you're going to go to Rome and you're going to preach the gospel in Rome. And the, and the angel says to Paul, take courage because you're still going to Rome. I promise that. My promises are yes and amen. They will be fulfilled. You're going to Rome. You're not going to die in this shipwreck because I promise you're going to Rome. And the angel said, keep courage because God's promises will be fulfilled. That's the second thing that we need to do in the midst of storms. Go back to the promises of God. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you. Plans for welfare, not calamity. To give you a future and a hope. Romans chapter 8. If God be for us, hey, who could be against us? That's a promise. Promise of verse 37 and all these things. We overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. The promise of Romans 8 too that nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Amen? And that's, hey, that's another reason why I love church too. Listen, one of the reasons I love church too is not only that, we, that it keeps us in God's presence when we're together, church also keeps us in God's promises. Because where is God's promises found? Right in the word of God. And the more we get in the word of God, the more we study the word of God, the more we're going to be assured of God's promises. And Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And one of the great things is as you're fighting storms in life, you get back in the word and God's word is a lamp on your feet, a light on your path, and you get back into God's promises and it builds faith to endure the storm because you're in God's promises. Amen? And that's what Paul's doing here. He said, hey, God's promise we're going to Rome, and this angel told me, keep courage because you're still going to Rome. You're not going to die in the shipwreck. And then verse 27, it says, but when the 14th night had come, as we were being driven about in the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors began to surmise that they were approaching some land. And they took soundings, in other words, depth soundings, and found it to be 20 fathoms. Uh, a fathom is six feet. 20 fathoms, they're at 120 feet deep water. And then they went out a little farther, they took another sounding and found it to be 15 fathoms. So they're going from 120 feet to 90 feet. And fearing that we might run aground uh, somewhere on the rocks, they cast four anchors from the stern and wishing for daybreak. And as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship, interesting, they let down the ship's boat into the sea on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the boat. Okay, the ship's boat that's being talked about is the dinghy, the lifeboat. And so they're saying, these sailors are saying, okay, enough for this we have 14 days, we've been in the midst of a major storm. Let's let the lifeboat down and let's jump ship. Let's get out of here. There's 276 people on board, but we got this dinghy, so let's just get out of here. And Paul said to the centurion, to the soldiers, unless these men remain in the ship, you yourselves cannot be saved. You know why? Because they were the sailors. They were the ones that were going to steer them aground so they could get out of this thing. And Paul says, don't let these sailors jump ship. Here's another thing, another thing for storms. If you want to survive a storm and even thrive in a storm, listen, don't jump ship. What do I mean by that? A lot of times our human nature, our flesh, we're in the midst of a storm, we just want to get out of there. Sometimes you're in a marriage storm. We just want to, we just want to jump ship. Hey, let me tell you something. If you're in a marriage storm, the grass isn't greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it and cultivate it. Don't jump ship on your marriage just because you're going through a marriage storm. Get some help, yeah. Get some Christian counseling. Go to our marriage group. Do whatever you need to do, but don't jump ship. I've seen that also not only in marriage. I've seen that with uh, jobs, businesses. 
Someone goes through a storm on job or maybe a business they started and they jump ship way too early. And there's a breakthrough right around the corner at that job or that, or that business and God, God will eventually, sometimes you just need to persevere, man. Don't jump ship. I've seen that also with family members. I've seen family members get so sick and tired of the wayward son or the wayward father or the wayward whoever, they jump ship on that family member and they write them off. And it's, don't do that. God doesn't write you off. Don't sh- jump ship on people that are part of your family just because they're messed up. Hey, we all got some crazy family members, right? You might be a crazy family member, right? Don't jump ship on people, man. God hangs in there with you. You hang in there with people. Don't jump ship. I've seen that even with the Lord. I've seen people come into trials and storms and there's walk with the Lord and there's tough times and they get so upset with the tough times and the storm, they jump ship on the Lord. And they just walk away from the Lord and backslide or whatever else. Don't do that, man. When you're in a storm, the, like I said, the greatest thing you can do is not run away from God, but run to God. He's a strong tower and the righteous run to it and they're safe, man. Don't jump ship. It's an important principle in the midst of storms. So Paul says, don't jump ship. We need you on this ship. Then verse 32, then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat, let it fall away, let the dinghy go until the day was about dawn and Paul was encouraging them to take some food, saying today is the 14th day you've been constantly watching. You've been so preoccupied with the storm, you haven't eaten in 14 days. And you're going without eating, have, having taken nothing. Therefore, Paul says, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation, for not a hair from your head of any of you shall perish. It's interesting. Paul says, "Just hey, let's get practical here. We've been in a storm for 14 days. You guys have been so stressed about this storm. You haven't eaten in 40 days. Time to eat. Take care of yourself. Have you ever been in a storm like that where you don't take care of yourself because of the stress of the storm? And what happens? The storm storm goes from bad to worse. So here's another principle. Not only don't jump ship, but take care of yourself in the midst of the storm, especially with health and physical stuff. Sometimes the best thing you do in the midst of the storm is after you stay in God's presence after you stand on his promises. Hey, take a nap and take care of yourself, man. Sometimes the most spiritual thing I do when I'm struggling with something, I'm just going to go take a nap. Or I'm going to do something, I'm going to go take a walk. I'm going to do something physically that can help me. And you know, take care of yourself physically in the midst of a storm because don't neglect that because then the storm will go from bad to worse. Do what you need to do to be healthy, man. Amen? So Paul says, let's eat. Time to, time to take care of yourselves physically because you haven't eaten for 14 days. And then verse 35, and having said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and he broke it, and he began to eat. And all of them were what? Encouraged. And they themselves also took food, took care of themselves. And all of us on the ship were 276 persons. Paul's leadership's outstanding. Not only does he direct them to take care of themselves, not only does he direct them to God and say, God's promised us this, and God's angel has shown me this, but Paul, amazing, now goes on and says, hey, well, we're all gonna pray. He's a bunch of pagan sailors, a bunch of prisoners on board. He says, okay, every 276 people, bow your heads. We're praying right now. We're gonna thank God for this food. We're gonna thank God that he's gonna take us through this storm. Exercise spiritual leadership in the midst of this. And you know what? I bet you after 14 days of not seeing the sun or the stars and having like a northeastern hurricane blowing them like crazy and losing even the boat possibly with having to put cables on it, I bet you every one of those people, what'd they do? Okay, we're gonna pray. There's no such thing as atheists or agnostics in the, in, in, in the midst of a storm like that, right? <clears throat> Here's another principle in the storm. Maintain an attitude of gratitude. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, in everything, even in storms, in everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen? And what we need to do when storms hit is do what Paul did and follow his example in Acts 16 after he just got arrested with false accusations, got beaten with rods and thrown in stocks. It was about midnight and they were giving praise to their God and rejoicing in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. 
And what we need to do when storms hit is we need to make sure we stay in an attitude of gratitude and we thank God for the blessings that we do have. No, no matter what storm you face, if you're a Christian, you got Christ. You have heaven as your home. You have the forgiveness of your sins. You have, you have the Holy Spirit to be your helper in that storm. And what we need to do when those storms hit is be like Paul, thank God in the midst of the storm for all the blessings that we do have. We need to count our blessings in storms and not be getting bitter and disappointed with God and running away from God. No, no, no. Stay in his presence, stay in his promises, take care of yourself physically, but also maintain an attitude of gratitude and thank God for all the good things that are in your life. James tells us anything good in our lives, every good and perfect gift is from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shifting shadow, right? And so we need to be people and maintain this attitude of gratitude, even in the midst of the storm, as Paul is doing now, leading these guys in prayer and thanking God for all his provision in the midst of the storm. And then it says, verse 38, when they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. They started throwing out the the whole surplus of food that they had, they were, they were bringing to Rome. They threw it in the sea. And when day came, they could not recognize the land, but they did observe a certain bay with the beach. And they resolved to drive the ship onto it if they could. And casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea, while at the same time they were loosening the ropes of the rudders, ho- uh, hoisting the foresail to the wind. They were heading for the beach. But striking a reef where two seas met, they ran the vessel aground, and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable. But the stern began to be broken up by the force of the waves. And the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, that none of them should swim away to escape. Again, if you're a Roman soldier, prisoners get away, you could be executed for letting prisoners escape. And the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, that none of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion wanted to bring Paul safely through. Why? Because Paul saved his life. He says, we're not going to kill prisoners. Paul's a prisoner. We're going to take him through this. He saved our lives. And they kept them from their intentions and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest should fall on planks, swim on planks, and other on various things from the ships. And thus it happened that they're all brought, what? Safely to the land. Hey, last principle if you're in a storm. Very practical. You know what it is? Grab a plank and swim. What do I mean by that? Do something, man. Sometimes in the midst of a storm, just grab a plank and swim. You got a part to, you got a part to play in the midst of surviving the storm. Do what it takes to get through the storm and, and, and on your part. And what do I mean by that? If you're in a marriage storm, don't just stay in the marriage storm. Get some help, man. Go get some marriage counseling. Go to a marriage group. Get some accountability. If you're in a storm, marriage storm, just grab a plank and swim. If you're in a financial storm, do something about it. Get out of debt, man. Start listening to Dave Ramsey. Go, go to our financial peace us group. You listen to, at least listen to his podcast. I tell you what, it's kind of entertaining too, but he'll, he'll slap you right in the face if you're in debt. And that's, sometimes that's what we need, right? Godly counsel again, right? Grab a plank and swim. Do something to make your situation better in regards to seeking help. I've seen it over and over again. I've seen marriages survive and even thrive Because somebody grabbed a plank in that marriage and began swimming by getting help. Seen that with our U-turn ministry. I've seen guys get to the end of their rope, said, I'm coming into U-turn, I'm going to do something about this addiction. And now they're on my staff as pastors. Some of them are. Because they grabbed a plank and they did something about their addiction. I've seen that in business too. I've seen people that were going down the drain in their businesses or their jobs. And they got some help. Got some coaching. They grabbed a plank and swum, uh, started to swim in that situation by doing something about their situation. I think one of the main reasons why we stay in storms sometimes is because of the boastful pride of life and we're thinking we don't need anybody to help us. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Two are better than one, and the cord of three strands is not easily broken. Amen? 
So get, grab a plank and swim, man. Go find someone to help in the midst of your storm. Don't do it alone. Satan thrives and devours us when we're isolated. Two are better than one. A quarter of three strands is not easily broken. What did we learn this morning about storms? Good stuff. Very practical. Hey, first of all, if you want to avoid storms instead of go into storms, don't disregard or do, don't disregard danger for the desires of your flesh. We have good instincts usually. We know what we're getting into. And when we're going into dangerous situations, don't disregard that danger just because your flesh wants to do something stupid. Number two, don't disregard the counsel of godly people. When people are speaking, especially from the word of God in your life, don't disregard the counsel of godly people. It'll bring on storms if you do. And then the principles that Paul exercised in his leadership. Number one, what do we do when storms hit? Stay in what? God's presence. Number two, trust in what? God's promises. Don't, number three, don't jump ship. Persevere, man, through the storm. Don't escape by jumping ship. Number four, take care of yourself, what? Stay healthy. Number five, maintain an attitude of, and number six, <laughs> grab a plank and swim. Amen? Do something. Get some help. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. Thank you that your word brings life, brings truth, and brings help to us. Thank you, God, most of all this morning that we've seen that even when we face storms, we're not alone. You're with us. You promised us, God, that you will never leave us nor forsake us, and lo, you will be with us always, even to the end of the age. God, forgive us sometimes for the storms we bring into our own lives because we're not careful. We're not wise. And we disregard even dangerous situations because of the desires of our flesh. Forgive us, God, for the times we don't listen to godly counsel of godly people who are trying to give us direction from your word, God. Help us maintain ears to hear what your spirit wants to say to us through your word and through godly people. Lord, help us to be people, too, that are applying these principles of how to deal with storms. And that's help us to stay in your presence always, God. Your name is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it and are safe. Thank you, God, that you're our rock, you're our fortress, you're our deliverer. Help us not to run away from you in storms, but run to you, Lord. Help us to trust in your promises too, God, that you have promises all throughout this book that we could cling to in the midst of storms. Help us to be people too that are, are people that are, 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 are not jumping ship just because life is rough, but we're persevering through that storm and hanging in there. I pray too that we'd be wise and taking care of ourselves, Lord. And, and maybe uh, that might, might mean getting more exercise or more rest or eating more carefully, whatever. Help us to be wise in that area too, Lord. And help us, Lord, even in the midst of the storm, to maintain an attitude of gratitude because, God, you have been so good to us. We have tasted and seen that you are good. And blessed are we because we put our trust in you, Lord. Help us to always not forget all the blessings that we have, even in the midst of the storm. Because if we have Jesus, we have everything, God. I pray, too, that we grab a plank and swim in the storm. We get the help that we need to survive and even thrive in the midst of the storm, God. Thank you, God, that you're our greatest help. You are, again, our fortress, our deliverer, our strong fortress, God. Lord, I pray for anybody that might be in a storm this morning. I pray, God, that they'd apply these principles and you'd help them get through the storm and you'd help them with your presence and your love and your promises and your strength, God. Thank you, God, that you're with us and you're for us. Thank you that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. We have that love through Jesus. Bless this day, Father. Help us to, again, be grateful, Lord, because you have been so good to us, Lord. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. And all God's people sit.